Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Flat Out Racing Network's broadcast of the Dark Horse IndyCar, sorry, Dark Horse Racing Series. Uh, my name is once again Scott Rankin. Joining alongside me is Alex, Mr. Pocono, um, and I've forgotten your last name. Colonics, there it is! With the way the broadcasting has been going this evening, I'm not surprised I've forgotten your name. We are round number eight of the championship here for Dark Horse. It is the DW12 series coming to you live from Kentucky. Green flag is in the air. Apologies for coming to you late on in the piece. Qualifying went in the way of Matt Wagner with a 24-751. Luis Gonzalez Nunez, Nick DeGroot, Jari Brewpucker, and the return of Rick Ravon wearing the number one badge to the Dark Horse series. Alex, it is going to be an interesting night here at Kentucky. It's been a while since we've been to this track, and uh, the guys seem to have settled down nicely. I mean, somebody who has settled down nicely already is Nick DeGroote, who's already searching for the lead from that third starting position. He made a fantastic move around the outside of turn two, but he's going to actually lose out coming out of turn two. As now, I believe that's Craig, no, Rick Raven going up the inside of Matt Wagner, our leader, looking for the lead. Guys are yeah, already he's... battling hard. Yeah, Wagner's going to look to get the run off the top side, looking to try and defend his lead best as he possibly can. He's going to hang on to it for the moment. Has the momentum coming from the top side. DeGroote. Looking for the run to the inside, not quite going to get there. Starts to build it back up once again, backs up the corner, gets to the throttle. He's going to go to the inside of Rick Raybon, painting the yellow line on the bottom of the racetrack. Three wide for the first time tonight for the lead of the race, and Raybon is the one that comes out ahead. Return to the series, return to the lead, and it is good to see Rick Raybon back out on track. Yeah, Rick Ravon, fantastic move over to take the inside lane on Matt Wagner early on in the race and to be able to hold off Nick DeGroote in the middle lane. But Nick is coming back at him already out of turn two, up the inside into turn three. It looks like he's just going to let him by and we'll run the high lane. We'll see if he gets a run down the straightaway and we'll take it back or not, or if he's just going to lose out. One of the strengths of Rick Ravon from previous seasons gone by was that he was able to keep the pace on the long run. And Craig Forsyth now going to show the nose to the inside. Matt Wagner looks to be saving a little bit of tire, a little bit of fuel. That seems to be his strategy early on. Remember, this is a DW12 car, weight jacker, fuel mapping, ARBs, all not toggleable within the car. You've got to drive it how it is. And uh, I just get the feeling that tires were his biggest concern here. Yeah, it could be for certain this racetrack's a lot tighter than where we were at last time was at Pocono. Very full throttle, very wide, very fast as Craig Forsythe's taking the lead. Racetrack, especially down here as they head into three and four, very hard on the tires. So these guys have to be careful through here if they want to save tire and be able to save fuel. Now, talk to us about running the lines around the track here, Mr. Pocono Colonics. Uh, it's... A little bit different to last week. Uh, over at Pocono, there was pretty much just the one groove on the legacy variant of that track in the DW12s. Here, there's a quite a few grooves going on, and there's a cute few markers as we'll actually see Matt Wagner once again show the nose to the inside. So the top four looking to swap the lead back and forth all night long. Wagner gets some fresh air to the nose, so he gets actually a reasonable run off the corner. He's going to be able to defend it from Nick to Groot. Rick Ravon lines him up now, so Ravon will slide past the Groot. Ravon to the outside of Matt Wagner here, looking to optimize the draft. Wagner's on the bottom. Little bit of non-functioning arrow for him at the moment, but Ravon was not able to maintain the momentum around the top side. Wagner strong off of one and two to the inside, takes the lead momentarily. Now it's going to be Craig Forsythe prevented from the top side and heavy racing already for what is 120 laps here from Kentucky tonight. Yeah, and as you saw with a lot of the shuffling around, down here in turns one and two, you could pretty much take any lane you want. The track's got enough banking that these Indy cars just go full throttle around the corner, and it's all a matter of momentum. But when you get down here into turn three, you have to lift at least a little bit in the draft when you're heading at these speeds, and whoever can lift off early enough and be able to get back on the gas quick enough is going to have the best run through that corner and be able to save the most tires. That's going to have to be where we watch what lines these guys take searching for clean air so that they don't have to lift as much. Now look, it's something that popped into my mind when I was preparing for the broadcast this evening, but uh, I'd like to point it out. Uh, the, the driver from New Zealand takes the opening win. Now, now it's Scott McLaughlin. He's an, he's an Aussie at heart. We'll, we'll, we'll claim him over here in Aussie land, even though he is uh, a Kiwi by origin. Were you a fan of the Scott McLaughlin victory uh, from St. Petersburg, Alex? Well, all I know is that every single person I saw on Twitter really enjoyed it, so I must be a very enjoyable man. I apologize to you IndyCar fans out there. I, I don't follow it nearly as much, but definitely was cool to see a new guy win in that series for sure. 
Now in his second season, I mean, he finished on the podium at his first ever oval course last season. If you are interested in getting involved in any of the IndyCar series within iRacing, uh, this is definitely one of the better leagues to start. There's a lot of drivers out here within the dark horse in the Area 51 combo that are willing to teach. One of those is in the lead at the moment, Matt Wagner, always makes himself available to teach IndyCars. Nick DeGroote, a force to be reckoned with. Craig Forsyth as well. All these guys, if you get on and talk to them, uh, they will have a great discussion with you about how to drive these cars, how to optimize them, how to get the most out of them so that one day you can be the Scott McLaughlin of the future or maybe the Alex Pelot Pato Award. There's so many names within IndyCar that are so popular these days and uh, returning to the action on the track at this point in time. Settle down now a little bit, Alex. The drivers seem to have found their rhythm and they're not really contesting for the, the clean air situation as much right now. Yeah, but that clean air, even though they're not contesting for it nearly as hard, it's still going to be a concern because if you could find any of it at all, that's going to, definitely going to help out your tire, which is why I, I feel bad for pretty much anybody past our fourth place driver, Rick Raven, at the moment, as they really don't have an opportunity to find any clean air. But the driver I'm currently looking at is the driver side by side for the lead, Craig Forsyth. He's been taking some interesting lines I've noticed has been giving him just enough clean air, but taking a route that seems very easy on the tire almost every single lap that he can. And he's sitting there in second place, so he's going to have great exposure to clean air while also having the draft on the straightaway. But Rick Raven does not want to keep him in second any longer. Yeah, return to the series, return to form for Rick Ravon. Let's let's actually talk about some of the methods and some of the abilities that the drivers had to save tires here. The, the One of the things that gets talked about all the time is backing up the corners. What does backing up the corners entail, Alex, and what does it do for the tires, and how do you save those tires? Well, especially when you're backing up a corner, especially when you have a very tight race car, as a lot of these guys Whoop. will have in the dirty air. One second, Rick Alex. Raven. Yeah, we're going to have to talk about that. Ravon deep to the inside. Craig Forsyth was looking to make a run to the outside of Matt Wagner and had to back out of that one. Ravon's going to position himself in that second position. They're going to go side by side this time. Wagner offers the drafting support to the top lane. Now the shortest run around the track is going to be offered to Rick Ravon. He'll get the move done on the bottom of Craig Forsyth. And now with the run to the inside of Matt Wagner, Matt Wagner's going to compromise his entry speed, knock some of that momentum away from Rick Ravon. Ravon will have to yield, but he will slot into second, and that might be important for his race. Anyway, back to backing up corners and how that works on the tires. <laughs> well, that's we'll something that I'm watching Rick Ravon. He, Ravon, he doesn't seem to be doing nearly as much as the other drivers. He seems to be going into the corner a little bit harder, but he's taking a lot more clean air, looking for these moves like this where he could get runs down the straightaway and just try and see if he could take the lead and have the best clean air out front. Seems to be able to hold it quite well at a turn four there, but that, that's something these other drivers may be doing is backing up the corner. And essentially what that does is that means you're going into the corner a little bit slower. You're not putting as much force on that tire, not producing as much heat, not producing as much wear. So they'll be able to save a little more tire doing that. But the other way to save tire is simply to be out front and have the Whoa, best air Wagner. as Matt Wagner goes around off the side of Rick Ravon. Now, I'm wondering if there was contact there or it was the good old-fashioned gap whack. We'll have to roll that one back and have a look at it. I'm sure our broadcaster will let me know when we've got a replay ready to go as well. So we'll keep an eye on that one from Matt Wagner. Drifted up onto the middle of the track from the bottom. First time that Wagner was pinched towards the bottom of the track. And first mistake that come up uh, from Matt Wagner. It looked like Ravon was drifting towards the top end of the track. And I'm sure there'll be a discussion between the drivers about... Uh, who is at fault there? Replays coming up on screen now. You'll probably see it. Keep your eyes on Matt Wagner. First time that he got to the bottom of the racetrack, you'll see him drift up on the corner exit. It looked like Ravon held his line. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure if Ravon held his line, but uh, no harm, no foul. So I'm, I'm sure we'll let that one go. Yeah, luckily it doesn't look like there was any damage given to Matt Wagner in that incident. It's just a little bit of a spin there, but that will bring out the caution and bring these drivers down onto the pit lane. Lap 20 here into this race out of 120. We'll see if, what this does to the fuel strategy here tonight. That could be something that comes up like it was last week at Pocono, where it was really, really tight. Luckily here, though, 100 laps at Kentucky is significantly shorter than 100 laps at Pocono. <laughs> it is. It's also got a lot more full throttle time than you get at Pocono. So fuel going to be a critical factor here tonight. Yo, Brew Parker, in and out, nice and quickly. Opting for the fuel-only stra strategy is what I'm assuming out of that one, unless he just drove straight through. I'm 
going to be checking on that in a moment. It looks like he did miss his pit stall from what I'm seeing. He <laughs> seemed to have just missed it a little bit and just drove straight through. So we'll see him come back down. That'll leave Rick Ravon back into the first position going on to the restart. And that's a crucial spot right there. That first position, even though a little bit weaker on new tires, is still going to provide the best air out front of this race car and give them the most grip. Now, talk to us about fuel windows here, because one of the biggest aspects within these indie cars and within these fields uh, is the strategy. But you've got to play yourself into that strategy to actually have a picture of what you can do with the car, what you can do with the fuel, what you can do with the tires. You need to know the fuel window. What's that critical fuel number for tonight, Alex? Well, that's going to be a question that I'm looking at personally myself. The opportunity to check in with a couple drivers tonight was very limited. So we're actually going into this with a little bit of a question of that ourselves. Oh, okay. So that's going to be something we're going to have to watch because here at Kentucky, turns one and two are full throttle. So there's pretty much no f fuel saving down into that corner. But when you go down into three, that's a lot slower of a corner and puts a lot more force onto the tires you can back up that corner a lot more and try and get a, a bigger run off and save both fuel and tire at the same time so who does that the best could end up being the winner of the race well so it was matt wagner early on and then he had that plowing moment coming up from the top from the bottom to the top fighting for the lead with rick ravon ravon will maintain the lead no harm no foul to him and it looks like a no harm for matt wagner as well we'll continue on We'll see how he goes. I believe he selected to give himself an end of line penalty. So restarting out of the 13th position. Long way to climb back through the field. It'll be interesting to keep an eye on him on the restart. Lights now off on the iRacing pace car. We will be back to green at the end of this lap. It will be pulling off in just a few moments. Single file restarts. Rick Ravon to control the field. Restart in control of the leader. Um, initial start was on the green. So we've got that out of the way. Single file. Let's see how these guys go. Normally, you'll see them up against the fence to prevent uh, overtaking on the initial jump. It looks like ravon has got a different idea. He's thinking with the noggin tonight. And running it on the low side. Shorter way around the track. Might be the shortest way to turn number one. Up through the gears, they'll now go. Foot to the floor for Rick Ravon. Craig Forsythe got an amazing restart just in immediately behind him. So look for Forsythe to be aggressive as they come on down to turn number one at the moment. Now Nick DeGroote gets a run. A double draft from two spots back in third position. Forsythe to the outside. He's pulled away from the draft. Now it's going to be DeGroote. DeGroote is going to show the nose inside. Forsythe backs out of it. Ravon's going to hold the middle line, look to hold the momentum, but Nick DeGroote got back on the throttle very early. He's still there. Ravon will finally clear him. Ops to not come down the track. He's going to stay on the high line. Look to defend that one at this point in time, not off to the drafting support. Luis Nunez has decided he wants to go with the lead pack. This restart didn't get quite a good jump on the initial one, but now he's right here with these guys. He's still there, still in the picture. Matt Wagner starting to cut his way through the field. He's up to P11. There's a huge battle pack there from P5 all the way down to about where Matt Wagner is in P11. So he will start cutting his way through the field as well. So lots going on in this second restart of the night, Alex. And it almost looks like the first start was basically just figuring things out. Uh, although I am very impressed by the positioning. Caution! Caution is out. Go ahead again, Alex. So you were about to about to talk about Rick Ravon's restart, I believe, right there. Well, we were a little bit interrupted by a caution there. That was very sudden out of that driver. I believe that was Benjamin Combs, I believe that was, who spun around there. I'm going to have oh. to check in on that, but... Replay will be coming up here, I believe, in a few moments' time. We'll get on top of that one. But uh, the driver's talking about it. It just seems to be a mistake uh, in the in the dirty air, Alex. It's, it's just so easy to do with, uh, at, these, at these circuits here where you've got so much momentum going through the corners. Yeah, and Charles G got sent to space, as you saw there on the replay, after contact with Benjamin Combs into the wall coming out of turn two down the back straightaway. That might be a race-ending maneuver right there for Charles Teed. Well, look, I knew I knew that Charles Teed was, was an interesting driver. I didn't know that he was a gymnast. There's several somersaults in there, moves I've never seen before, and uh, he comes out of it at the other end. He's able to drive the car back to pit lane, get the fast repair. So 
even though his ankles may have been broken in all the gymnastic moves, they, uh, they're back to fixed and uh, he's going to continue on. So there you go. Gymnastic prowess of Charles Teed at work. Well, there's a bit of an interesting development we've got live on the pit lane is that from seventh on back, pretty much every driver pit, but up ahead of that from six forward, every driver has stayed out. So that's going to put them in an interesting position both fuel and tire wise. I don't think tire because of how few laps they ran is going to really be an issue. It's more just going to be how long do they go green here? Will this split the field up if it does go green? Well, six laps is the fuel margin since they last come back down pit road. Um, however, most of that was spent under caution, so it's not going to be as big a factor as you may think. 27, we're on, I believe, 28 laps at the moment. So no, we're on lap number 27 at this point in time about to come around and start lap 28 so just under a quarter of the way through this motor race we've already had two major cautions cars are running exceptionally quickly in double and triple drafts guys starting to figure it out and the restart there i think luis nunez on the initial start may have felt a little bit at sea but now he's figured that out and he's starting to push uh, a little bit higher in the field yeah nunez is definitely coming back a little bit with a strong fight there on that last restart to hang on to the fourth position but just before that caution came out I was talking a little bit about Rick Ravon's positioning and I think that was crucial for him to hold the lead there is the restart is going to be where the leader is the weakest that aerodynamic advantage is much less going over the first lap as the cars are not yet up to full speed and we saw that coming out of turn two he was under attack by both Craig Forsyth and Nick DeGroote what was key in his positioning was he was, ran the middle of the racetrack, put Craig Forsyth to his outside, and forced Nick DeGroote from all the way back in third to run the very bottom, giving Ravon the position in the middle lane, ran Craig wide, and then proceeded to have Nick DeGroote stuck there on the bottom, not able to wind up his car and give himself momentum. So that was some fantastic positioning on that first lap to hold the lead. And that's just what it's about, isn't it, Alex? It's about positioning. Yeah, at some point during the night, you're going to have to make a mistake. You're going you're gonna to show the opponent the nose. But if you position the car in an awkward position, that means that the opportunity that presents itself isn't the best opportunity. Yeah, that, that is essentially the key to restarts in all of racing. It's just to put the car in the right spot. And even though you know that driver behind is going to get the position on you, it might not be the position they want to be in. Well, Ravon now has control of the field. Pace car has made its way back down a pit lane. We'll see how this one winds up and gets going here in a few moments' time. And there they are. They're off and racing back up through the gears. Rick Ravon leads it away from Craig Forsyth. He's got a huge jump on this one. Ravon, though, will be offering a huge draft chain this time by. So it won't be until we get to corner number four. But once we get out of four, you will feel that the draft will be on and Forsyth might just have the momentum he needs to get uh, his car around the gold charger of uh, Rick Ravon. There it is. He's right there. He's right there. He's right there. He's to the outside of Ravon. Doesn't even want to wait. Lifted out of it slightly to get back in the draft. Nick DeGroote now fending off Luis Gonzalez Nunez to the top side. Gonna try and hold the momentum. High, wide, and handsome from Luis Nunez. And I believe that's Jim Brooks that's tagged into this battle. Foresight now says, all right, Wagner couldn't get it done on the inside of you. I've got fresher tires. I'm going to have a go. And he's got it done. Craig Foresight to the lead of this race for the first time tonight. Yeah, that was a great maneuver there by Craig Forsyth to fall back purposefully before turn one and two and get the run off that back straightaway down into turn three. Doesn't have to deal that time with Nick DeGroot trying to take it three wide with that position and allowed him to take the lead. As we see, I believe that's Nunez going for the third position on DeGroot. Great move from him. Yeah, Nunez all the way down the bottom. Now it's going to be Jim Brooks that says, hey, this has been opened up by Luis Gonzalez. Nunez, I'm going to have a go. AJ Hobson lines Nick DeGroot up as well. So he'll be the next one in the picture. Jeff Hysong running the highest that he's run tonight. And there it is in the background. Matt Wagner finally tags his way back onto this lead pack. Nunez trying to show the nose to the bottom end of Craig Forsyth. Forsyth will shut it down, start feeding him daily air. Nui's needed to back it out and did so to slot back in behind Ravon. The car's getting real tight on the bottom of the circuit, starting to drift up on acceleration. But something we're seeing that's very different 
is that there's a lot more cars involved in this lead battle this time. The last couple restarts has only been four cars. Now you've got five, six, seven cars all up here at the front battling for the lead. What is that going to do to the positioning of the leaders? Who's going to be safe where? And have a look at things as it stands at this point in time as well. In terms of where these guys are going to set their overtakes up, in terms of the lanes they're running, Luis Gonzalez Nunez on his entry to turn number four, he is trying his absolute hardest to show that noise underneath Craig Forsyth and get any downforce he possibly can to that front wing. His tires are going to be screaming right now. Have a look at Hobson. Hobson's running in his best position so far tonight. He's going to start having a crack here at Luis Gonzalez Nunez. He's going to the high side. Rayvon's going to have another go at Craig Forsyth. That that's going to offer AJ Hobson some support on the top line. And we have a motor race for something that I thought we might have a four car breakaway. All of a sudden it's turned into a four car break down and break back into the pack. They're definitely breaking back in the pack as Nunez was up in second there just a little bit heading down to turn three. It's going to lose out down out of turn four. But Rayvon's just been strong around that outside. He washed up a little bit at turn two last time by. We'll see if he does it again this time, as now AJ Hobson's looking for the second position coming out of turn two. And have a look at Nunez. Nunez has migrated to the top side, swapped positions with AJ Hobson. Ties were screaming. They were yelling a bit on the bottom side. Luis is going to set it towards the bottom side of the track. That is where Jim Brooks, Jeff Hysong, those guys are sort of lurking around. Slots back in behind Hobson, but have a look at the lead. Rick Ravon gets it to the inside. He's going to steal it away from Craig Forsythe. Once again, just great positioning. Finds his way to the inside of Craig Forsythe. That's key when the tires start to wear out a little bit. It's just finding that inside lane. The outside lane just puts so much strain on the tire, especially down turn four. But he gets loose out of turn four. That's going to allow Craig Forsythe to go back at him. Not going to get enough of a run out of four. Here comes Nick DeGroote for the second spot. Yeah, DeGroote, I was just keeping an eye on him. Backed it up within the pack. Just sort of sat on the tires a little bit. Let them do their thing. And now he's coming back. He got a huge draft. There were two cars ahead of him. They were the two leaders. And now he's to Craig Forsythe's outside. Five cars with a handkerchief thrown over them. Make it six with Jim Brooks on the entry to turn number four. And all of a sudden, this race blown completely and utterly wide open. And the guy that led most of our initial run in Matt Wagner is just sitting at the tail end of this, just watching, waiting, biding his time. Don't count him out right yet. He's still there. He's still in the shot and still in with a chance. And there's a lot of battling going on ahead of him. It's going to allow him to just relax and save his stuff up. But as we see, three wide down the front straightaway. AJ Hobson, Nunez, and DeGroote all battling down at oh. turn one. Wow, DeGroote all the way from the top to the bottom. Nunez is going to take it all the way from fifth up to the third spot. Might look for more down into turn three. Yeah, we'll see how this one goes for him. He's backing it up, trying to have it go. Here comes Hobson. Hobson's pinched him down. He's got a great run. I'm surprised they didn't make contact there. Great driving from AJ Hobson. He split the difference, made it a difficult margin, shut down the run from Luis Gonzalez Nunez. And now AJ Hobson's on for another phenomenal drive for him. He's right there in the window. Craig Forsyth looking to block it off, shuts the air down for Rick Ravon. Ravon's boxed in at the moment, can't really go anywhere. Finally gets the freedom to go back to the top line. Nick DeGroot all the way on the bottom side of the racetrack. He's trying to push his way forward. We are going to have a phenomenal race all night long. Can these guys, Alex, keep this up? Or are the tires going to fade away from them? I believe at some point these tires are going to go away from them. They're all battling so hard, especially down into turn three. You see them fan out into a ton of different lanes. Problem is, I don't like those higher lanes down into turns three and four. I feel it just puts too much strain on the tire. We're seeing a lot of guys up there as, again, the crossover for the lead. Ravon and Forsyth have been going at it this whole run. Now, this is the second time I believe Rick Ravon's actually pulled this crossover move to try and get the lead. Is this giving Craig Forsyth a whole bunch of information? Luis Gonzalez Nunez gets tied on the bottom. Might have caught the apron, slid up, saved it. And the rest of the pack have got the common sense to lift out, make sure that everyone gets to continue on with their race. So Ravon, though, may have given away his best secret to get into the lead. Will Craig Forsyth learn from that? I mean, that that's kind of an interesting thing because what Ravon's been having to do is he's been having to almost back up the corner down to three, not be running that high side and run that bottom and hook it around the bottom which is the line I like around here down in the three and four because it's the lane you put the least strain on your tire but for some reason it just seems to work on corner exit as well at this racetrack 
And we've been seeing a lot of drivers, once they get side by side, instead of backing out, they just battle on the outside and they lose a spot or two. It's now Forsyth down the third after AJ Hobson passed him. Well, I wonder if Forsyth's starting to suffer from some tire temperatures. Normally, Craig Forsyth, he is the king of composure. He is the guy that will hang on to the fuel, hang on to the tires, do the longest fuel runs just about of the entire field. Matt Wagner continuing to just lurk in the background. Don't count him out just yet. He'll be burning enough fuel to stay with these guys, enough tire to stay with these guys, and absolutely nothing more. That could play into the picture when we come around to a first round of green flag pit stops. Yeah, that could be the key, too. We might even see him in the lead if he's saving enough tire back there. As these guys are racing so hard that if he's just off the throttle, going into the corner a lot more slowly and using the draft to keep up, he could have a lot more tire at the end of this run. Is clutching going to potentially play a, a factor here tonight? Obviously, there's liftoff, which allows the car to really flow down in. You still get that engine braking, so you still got that little bit of loss of speed as well as the aero braking, uh, which happens anytime you're not applying the throttle, but maybe clutching, is that the way to go here? I think my problem is this track's just a little bit too quick. You are lifting down in a three, but you're never all the way out of it unless if you have a massive draft right behind somebody into the corner. These cars just carry just enough speed down to turn three. You never fully get out of the throttle. You leave just a little bit in to keep up your momentum around the corner. And so that's going to leave your options to try and save fuel out other than just doing what Matt Wagner is doing and just sitting in the back and using the draft. That's really the only way you can do it. I would like to point out that in this league, uh, I believe it was last season before, unfortunately, we was no longer really able to run with this. Um, Robert Moleska the third. This was his king strategy, what Matt Wagner is doing right now. He'd sit at the tail end of the lead pack and he'd just sit there. That's it. You guys go racing. You guys have fun. I'm going to win the race by just sitting here, by just spectating, by just watching and having a grand old time. You guys, the racing up there, it looks fantastic, Alex, but sometimes you just got to know when to, when to just bite your tongue a little bit, just sit there, just be patient. And that's, it's critical to a race car driver to know when to do that. Yeah, and at quite a few of these racetracks with these Indy cars, it's, that's just the strategy, really. You put so much strain racing out at the front, and leave yourself so exposed in that lead position, you end up just fighting way too hard looking for spots when you could just be relaxing in the back. Now, we didn't see that nearly as much at Pocono because the straightaways were so long that all the drivers were just focusing on getting their straight line speed. But here at Kentucky, there's a lot more to worry about, a lot tighter racing and almost faster, I'd argue, because you're going through those corners way quicker. Well, Luis Gonzalez Nunez seems to have recovered nicely, protected the tires a little bit. He's now going to be now trying to set himself up to the bottom end of Rick Ravon and uh, might actually see the lead over. Ravon's really strong towards this top side with the momentum. It starts to build. That pack is getting tighter. I thought we might start to see some spread out, but no, it's closing itself back up in again. Luis Gonzalez backs the corner up. You see him. He loses ground initially on that corner entry. That's to get the car to the bottom. Then he gets back to the power. That's when he starts to surge through. That shorter line around the racetrack really pays dividends in that phase of the corner. Ravon might clear him here. Clear him. He does. Immediately cuts down and shuts off the perfect air that Luis Gonzalez Nunez was looking for. And Forsyth has now got two cars to sit here and fuel save behind. And Nick DeGroote's right there as well. So the regular suspects now sitting up towards the front end of this pack. Now, one thing that's going to become a little bit of a strategy you can start playing as these tires start to wear out, that straight line draft down those straightaways is going to become bigger and bigger as these corners get slower and slower. That's where you're going to see a lot more passes. And what's going to happen is that if the leader is aware of the aerodynamics behind him, he can give the draft to whoever he wants and force the drivers behind to start battling side by side. Especially here in the Indy cars, I try something of that in NASCAR. It works out pretty well. But here in IndyCar, that draft's even way bigger than that. So we could see this leader just pick whoever he wants to be behind him going down the straightaways. It's all about setting it up. It only works if there's no car alongside of you. And Luis Gonzalez Nunez continues to want to be that car that runs alongside our leader at this point in time. I believe he might have just touched the apron. Might have just got a little bit squirrely. He's got no momentum. Cars are going to be checked up left, right, and center in behind him. This is critical for the pack. He's going backwards. And that is a big, big problem. Everyone has sorted themselves out. Great driving by the entire field there. What happened to Nick DeGroote? Nick DeGroote's going massively backwards as well. 
I'm actually curious as well. I was watching the lead just with you. It sounds like Nunez is actually coming into the pit lane. We're seeing some drivers come down the pit lane. I think this may be the end of our fuel window here. As both Rick Ravon and Nunez have come into the pit lane at the same time. Guys racing at the front of the field. Yeah, and those were the two guys as well, that two of the group of cars, sorry, that did not pit that second caution. We had a couple laps after the first one. Now you've got this pack, which has got... Craig Forsyth, pit on lap 21. Jim Brooks, pit on lap 21. AJ Hobson, pit on lap 21. Jeff Heisung, 21. Matt Wagner, lap 27. Nick DeGroote, lap 21. Gael Brooks, 27. T, 27. Brew Parker, 27. Benjamin Combs, 27. But they're a long, long way back. So it, to me, Matt Wagner is the only car that's up here that's got more fuel than everyone else. I mean, that's the strategy, right? You just want to be up there as we see AJ Hobson coming into the pit lane. Now, that's another one of those drivers that didn't come in and get fuel as well. So we're seeing these drivers start to pit in now. We're starting to see the field kind of spread out a little bit. And that's going to be key. Get on, get on and off pit lane. It's a little bit tougher here at this racetrack. Very, very slick on that apron down in turns one and two to get back onto the racetrack. That run down there could cause wreck spins as we're seeing even more drivers come down pit lane. Yeah, and it looks like Matt Wagner has finally pressed the go button. He has gone to the lead, and the two cars that go along with him is Gail Brooks and Charles T. So Wagner, at this point in time, will put the hammer down. He has not led a lap since he had that spin early on. Near contact with Rick Ravon. Well, that's all changed in the space of a couple laps, in the space of a fuel window. And talk to me about the numbers surrounding fuel. We went from, I think it was lap 21, with two cautions to, what, lap 56, lap 57? So about that 40-lap window, 45-lap window? Yeah, I was looking at our ticker over here. I think I was seeing about 38 to 39 laps, depending on where you were in the pack. So that's looking at the fuel we're going to be dealing with tonight. And that is just under splitting this race into thirds but remember we had that caution at lap 20 so that ended up splitting the field up and then the caution later on were these guys currently out in the lead pit so we're seeing different fuel strategies here i think the guys who are out front right now have a bit of an advantage so the guys right now out in the lead is gonna be matt wagner and gail brooks cars behind them of all pit Matt Wagner just come on the radio, said, I'm coming to pit road as well. That's a five-lap margin over the guys that pit out of that first cycle. You're looking at Luis Gonzalez. Nunez was one of the first drivers who came down pit lane. Gael Brooks is going to get another lap out of this tank. So he's now in the catbird seat. That's a long distance on fuel. That's a lot less fuel he's going to have to put in this car. And he was right towards the lead, towards the tail end there too. All right, so I think this is a bit closer to the accurate fuel number here. Is Matt Wagner went about... 35 laps before he ended up pitting in and his stint was from green to green compared to other drivers who had a lot more caution time so I think that's the fuel number we're going to be looking at if this continues to go green which from when we went back to the restart that'll give us I believe three or four pit stops in this final stint if it stays green so if it stays green, right. And critical lap number here is, is if the stint length is 35 laps in the draft in saving that critical lap number is going to be, what, 115 minus 30? So that's 80. Lap number 80, you have to get to before you can make it to the end. And, and to be perfectly honest, Alex, I think there's a few drivers that are going to be a little bit either side of that, although it looks like all the drivers actually now doing the math might just circle out in that uh, right in that spot. So things have worked out nicely. And I'll tell you what, Gael Brooks has actually made a real nice piece of it. He's leading this race. Oh, uh, he's just come off pit lane now. That's why he's leading the race. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, but he did have a pretty phenomenal pit stop for pretty much being out on his own running laps before. It's a little bit slower than in the pack, but he still came out in what is currently the third position. So he actually had a very phenomenal pit cycle and came through. He just sadly had nobody to work with when everybody else came in, so he lost a little bit of time off of that. But he's gone nice and deep into this race. Now it's going to be two separate packs by the look of things that are starting to work together. You're going to get Rick Ravon and Craig Forsyth working together. Then you've got Matt Wagner, Nick DeGroote, Gael Brooks, Jim Brooks. So both of the Brooks family are going to be in this pack and working together. And I believe that's Luis Gonzalez Nunez that's in there as well. Yeah, so you got a pack currently of two drivers out at front and then four drivers behind them. But the two drivers that are out front or Rick Ravon and Craig Forsyth, who were going at it a ton earlier on in the race. I'm not sure if we're going to see them battling each other, slowing themselves down, or if we're just going to see them 
relax and just see if they could work together and run solid laps and gap the field because if they could keep it between those two, it's going to be a crazy fight to the finish. Do you think it's going to be a slingshot draft attempt to break away from the pack or do you think that they're going to squabble a little bit, maybe bring each other back into it, maybe Craig's looking to fuel save just that little bit? What, do you think they should work together? Because this is Rick Ravon's first race of the season. This is round number eight. He's not in championship contention and, and Craig Forsyth definitely is. Well, just think about it this way from the perspective of Rick Ravon. If he leaves it between one driver that he's battling with, that's one driver versus four, five, six, seven, however many can be up there in the pack if they start battling. So it's better off just to start working together and try and gap the field as much as you can. But I say that they've started battling and they've actually lost about a couple tenths that lap just now so the field behind them is starting to catch up yeah and it's going to be critical rick ravon dips below gets the draft he's going to try and slide down the inside here once again we'll see if he does this uh, there's lap traffic just ahead as well in the form of joseph morales so be interesting to see what he does with how he plays into this they're now in his draft window but the big problem here is that matt wagner is closing into raider knots and he's going to creep up into their draft window as well yeah, the pack from third on back is catching up very, very quickly. Matt Wagner running some very fast laps, two tenths a lap on these two leaders. So this pack of four cars is catching up very, very quickly to these two leaders. We're not going to see them out front for very long. All right, well, Joseph Morales starting to be an issue, starting to feed some dirty air, and Rick Ravon, Craig Forsyth have got beef. Neither of them seem to want to work together. Pack is going to close. So give it another five or ten minutes here, and we'll have our motor race. So I tell you what, if you haven't seen what Dark Horse is capable of, you will see it uh, as we get closer to the LMCgear.com dash at Kentucky finale. Uh, here in about 50 laps time. These guys are capable of going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, lap after lap after lap after lap, quite comfortably. You saw it in that last run. This run's going to be a little bit tamer, and then it'll settle out again. Well, something interesting just happened on that lap. Guyo Brooks actually took the third position away from Matt Wagner, and they lost four tenths on the leaders on that lap alone. So even just a little bit of battling back there in that second pack, they lost a ton of time to the leaders. But now, now that Joseph Morales is in there, they've got that bridging car, that car that's sitting in between the two packs right in the draft window of the leaders and then right in the draft window of the second pack. So they're picking up draft and that, that car is being pulled along as well by our leaders. So that could be critical to this gap closing as well. I mean, it can be critical, but it can also hurt in the same breath because you have a car who's currently going a lap down, running in a little bit cleaner air than the leader of your own pack, which that's what you really need. When the guy leading the pack gets behind dirty air, it becomes a lot harder to make the corner faster, and it just hurts the whole pack as a whole. As they've actually lost a couple tenths the last two laps, probably because of that lap car wedged in between them. Well, as things start to settle out, Rick Ravon starts to run better times. The the thing that's now working in the leader's favor as well, they've stopped squabbling over it. I think I think Craig Forsyth's just happy to let Ravon lead a whole bunch of laps at this point in time. He's going to come in later on, take on less fuel, and put fresher tires on than Ravon's going to be able to have towards the tail end of this race. We'll see how that starts to pen itself out, keeping our eyes on the margins. He, again, Matt Wagner's pulled a tenth back out of them again this lap. So Wagner has now got the hammer down. He's got the bit between the teeth, and he's going for it. Yeah, Wagner's just completely separated from the pack that he was a part of, pulled out about four tenths on them. So he may just be a solo warrior looking to hunt down that lead pack. But, you know, we were talking about him sitting back in the pack trying to save some fuel. He didn't go that much further than the other guys who pit within his stint that were ahead of him. He only went about one or two laps further. So it doesn't seem to be fuel saving is very possible here at the race here today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's an interesting point, whether or not that actually plays out into anything as well, because I'm pretty sure from, from the last caution, no matter what happened, you're always in the, the two-stop to home window. So I don't, I don't think it actually matters when we, when we actually get down to the nitty-gritty of it either, Alex. Now, the key is going to be here, though, is what's going to happen on the next pit stop. We saw these guys pit 
around lap 60-ish, I believe. Last time it was lap 63 for Matt Wagner. And out front are the guys. We saw them pitting lap 59 for Craig Forsyth and lap 57 for Rick Ravon. So they're going to have to try and make it, like he said, to lap 85. If that would put them just on that fuel window to be able to make it to the finish. But can they make it? I believe Matt Wagner should pretty comfortably be able to make it. But will these other guys who didn't pit at that second caution, can they make it? Well, that's critical. Fuel numbers may end up deciding the race. Still yet to be decided. Let's take a look at the lap times as they continue coming in. 25.250 last time by for Rick Ravon. 276 for Craig Forsyth. Wagner was a 293, 348-222. So times up and down the pack, not falling away, not all that vastly different. So it looks like the, the cars are actually managing to hold onto their tires quite nicely here. Yeah, I think primarily what I've noticed when I was driving the car a little bit before the race is that you don't really see much wear. It's more just heat. If you abuse the tires battling or abuse the tires down here into three and four, that's going to really hurt you. But the actual wear of the tire itself doesn't really go down very much. You can run surprisingly hard and consistent laps as long as you're not overdoing it. Well, if you haven't had the benefit of taking some laps here of the Kentucky Speedway, right now you're on board with Craig Forsyth. You are getting that benefit of being able to run laps. So... Well, uh, Matt, I'm sure will tell me here in a moment if we don't have that prep, but I'd like to really go uh, listen in, turn it up and listen in to the IndyCar DW12 series as we go for a few laps here of lmcgear.com dash at Kentucky. Well, that's about it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the sights, sounds, and everything of the LMCgear.com dash at Kentucky. And whilst we were in that, the fight for the lead actually started to play itself out on your screen, focused in on the battle for the lead between Craig Forsyth and Rick Ravon. And now it seems Matt Wagner starting to play himself closer and closer and closer. And he's broken away from that trailing pack. So it's going to be a three-car fight as the pit window opens up here in a couple laps time. Yeah, it, uh, so far, every single person has made that lap 85. Now we're on 86 numbers. So I think it'll only be just one more pit stop to the end of this race. But that pit stop's going to be crucial. We see these two leaders. They had great pit stops and gapped the entire field. Matt Wagner trying to hunt them down, but he's just not had enough to be able to catch on to their draft and race with them. So this is going to be crucial. If you have a good enough pit stop, you could be the one in the battle for the win. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Getting it down onto pit road, getting it down there nice and cleanly, but also being aggressive on the pit end. And Craig Forsyth is going to be the first to blink. He's coming down pit road. He was fighting quite heavily with Rick Ravon. You get the feeling Ravon might be coming the next time by, whether that is fuel limitations or whether that is because he needs to keep an eye on where Craig Forsyth is. Forsyth is big on pit lane entries. Luis Gonzalez Nunez will be coming this time by as well. So here it comes. Rick Ravon is moving as fast as he possibly can. Yeah, pulls the car down all the way to the bottom, gets it on the pit road. That was a pretty clean pit lane entry. Not a single lock break there from Rick Ravon. Something that is interesting that I was looking at, I glanced over just to see how long that stint was for Craig Forsythe. That was only 28 laps. We have 32 laps left in the race, 33 at the time of him pitting. If he cannot make that, will he be able to make it to the finish? Because there is just not enough ability to fuel safe here without losing a lot of time. And crucially as well, I'm also looking at Rick Ravon's stint. He 
is right on the window. He went just about 32 laps before he got into his pit box, so he is exactly on that number to make it to the finish. I believe Rick Rayvon should be able to make it to the finish, but I'm a little bit worried about Craig Forsyth. He pit a little bit earlier. We'll see if it holds true, that 35-lap pit window, but I'm seeing a lot of drivers come in in the early 30s, not making it to that mid-30 number. Well, that's interesting. That is very interesting. A splash and dash will just about ruin it. And that would put Matt Wagner in the biggest seat in the house, the most important seat of the house, the guy that's furthest ahead that's going to be able to make the fuel window. Field is starting to come into the pit lane. The action down there is going to be thick and fast. Crew chiefs, keep your teams ready. Your guys are going to have to bail over that wall in a heartbeat. Get themselves down to the tires, get those guns on, get those tires off, get a new set on and get all of that fuel into the car for your driver to make it home to the end of the race. It is so critical. It's so important, Alex. Pulling up on your marks, making sure you make the pit lane speed limit. It can make and break a night of racing. Yeah, and for certain... Every single driver that's still out on the racetrack yet to make their pit stop and the drivers who have made their pit stop on this last lap are definitely going to make it to the finish. Everybody's at least made it to lap 30 on their pit cycle. But that leaves the question. Craig Forsyth was the only one who pit outside of the pit windows that I'm seeing a majority of these drivers have. Though, when he pit, there were about 33 laps left. And currently, Charles Teed is on a 33-lap stint. Will be 34 when he comes into the pit lane. So... There is precedent that he can make it, but Charles Teed was further back in the pack, so he had more of an opportunity to save fuel and keep pace. Craig Forsyth doesn't have as much liberty in that department. Right, so that is your numbers. That is all the fuel data brought to you by Alex, Mr. Pocono Colonics. And, uh, well, you earned that nickname last week with all the interesting facts, tidbits, and everything you told us about uh, Pocono. So we thank you for that, Alex. Your expertise in this department is well and truly loved, appreciated, and required. So don't you go anywhere. You're staying here with me to the end of the race. Nick DeGroot, let's see what he's currently able to do. Is that, sorry, I believe that might be Gael Brooks. It's actually uh, up on screen at uh, this point in time. Keep your eyes peeled. Matt Wagner's now made his final stop of the race. The whole field, except for Gael Brooks, have made their last stops of the race. This is a critical point in time. I feel like Gael's probably going to run this tank dry and come in late and make a late surge is probably going to be his strategy. Yeah, I mean, by this point, if you're staying out this long, you don't have any of the pace thanks to any drafts. So you're pretty much just relying on the fact that you're going to have a faster pit stop by underfueling the car and then being able to jump the field. But currently, he does have the entire field a lap down. So if by some miracle, a caution does come out before he makes his pit stop, which... He's going to have to make in the next lap or two. He's on a 33-lap stint right now. Could trap the whole field a lap down. All right. Well, that's how things have played out in terms of Gael Brooks. Let's take a little bit of a look further back in the pack. I tell you what, he's done a great job there, Gael Brooks, uh, with the Bender image. Can we get a look at I want to see what the gap between Craig Forsyth, Matt Wagner, and Rick Ravon looks like at this point in time. All right. Up on the screen... All cars just about within the same shot. All cars would be within everyone's draft window. So that means that gap to Rick Ravon is going to close. He is going to go out there running hard and as fast as he possibly can and offer as little draft to the cars behind as he can. So the pit stop for Rick Ravon was fantastic. Forsyth, generally the master on pit lane, not the master tonight. Matt Wagner, I believe, may have closed up a little bit on that pit lane entry, whether or not that's due to Forsyth not having the same level of pit stop. Matt Wagner, that's the gap. That's the task that he's got looking through the cockpit of his Delara DW12 IndyCar. Can he surge? Can he overtake the two cars ahead of him? And when Scale Brook come to pit lane? Well, the answer is he's in and he's on his way out at this point in time and he will not come out ahead of the leaders. So it is one, two, three, the battle that you see on your screen. It was a little bit of a slow stop there for Kyle Brooks. Lost even more time than what he had previous. So sadly, he won't be in contention for this win if we don't get a caution. But right now, the battle, once again, like we've seen almost this entire race, Rick Ravon and Craig Forsyth going at it. Matt Wagner is just about a second back off of these drivers. Not sure if he'll be able to run up onto this battle, but if these two leaders start battling hard enough, we can see him join the fight.
Yeah, and have a look at the, the arcs and the corners and the way that they're really being taken from Rick Ravon. You can see that Craig Forsyth is looking to chase him around the track, pick up as much draft as he possibly can. There's going to be another couple of interesting backs to play through down the track at this point in time. Just got my eyes on Luis Gonzalez, Nunez, and Charles Teed are going at it pretty intensely. And have a look in the background of this shot as well, Alex. It's Gael Brooks. That's where he come out. He come out right around where Nick DeGroot was. And this might be Nick DeGroot saving grace. He's lost a lot of time on pit road tonight. Yeah, if he hangs on the coattails of Gael Brooks and can find his way up to Nunez and Charles T, we could see a battle up here for the fourth position. But checking back up front, Craig Forsyth up the inside. Rick Ravon, I think he might get the position out of turn four. They're side by side down the front straightaway right now. They're racing extremely hard. I tell you what, this is critical for Matt Wagner as well. Keep your eyes further back on him because Wagner will start losing time. We'll see if Wagner close it up right now images still coming to you at the battle further back down in the pack of nick de groot and gail brooks uh, effectively in just mirrored cars there we go now dropping back to our leaders foresight to the inside and the light blue colored car and to his outside is rick ravon trying to get it done not quite able to do it that time by he'll back it up he'll build the momentum swings high and then he'll cut a little bit low on the corner make sure that he holds the momentum he holds all that speed gets a huge drop. Now it'll be Ravon back to the inside here of Forsyth. Forsyth, if he wants to let the battle play itself out into the conclusion of this race, might just let this happen, tuck back in and do what we call a slingshot draft. Uh, might be the go-to, but I think Wagner is actually in that draft window, so I don't think that would work to shake him off. And I was actually watching that battle there at a turn four. That was an extremely tight maneuver there between those two drivers. It didn't look it on screen, but they went all the way out to the wall. That's typically not where the line is here at this racetrack in that corner, but it looked like Ravon tried to do a slide job maneuver in front of Forsyth. Forsyth almost doing the same thing that lap. These drivers are going at it extremely hard, and that's allowing Matt Wagner to catch up. He's within seven tenths right now. I get the feeling. I cast my mind back, and I want to say it was David Cook. I think it was that was uh, Rick Ravon's teammate uh, at the tail end of last season, the last race of the season. Rick Ravon, I believe, had already locked up the title at that point in time, and somebody from that team of Rick Ravon's had contact with Craig Forsyth late in the race that cost a few guys a shot at the Indy 500 victory in the DW12 machine. So these two drivers will have beef between them. There will be no love loss, and I think you've seen that play itself out all the way through tonight. And, well, it's now past the point whereby you can give and take. Now it's racing for the line honors, and there's going to be 13 laps to go now, Alex. It, the mindset, it changes after that last pit stop. You're suddenly a lot less likely to give as much room as you were before. And these guys are going to start to run out of room here in a second, as now Matt Wagner is most definitely within the draft. Four tenths, now three tenths, two tenths. He's in this battle officially. We've got a three-car fight for the lead, and Matt Wagner has just been watching these two going at it. He's got to have the best stuff under him right now. And have a look further back down the pack as well. Matt Wagner's closing, but Charles Teed is starting to run up on these guys as well. So if Teed can all of a sudden get into Matt Wagner's draft, all of a sudden they're going to be pulled up on, and it's going to be a four, five, six-car battle because Teed's just in behind him. He's got Nunez coming with him. Man, after that last stint where we saw those two leaders pull out a gap on the field, I did not think we'd be seeing what could possibly end up being a five-car fight for the finish. But here we are. This is Dark Horse at its finest. Oh, Dark Horse isn't like a fine wine. It gets better with age. It gets better with experience. It gets better when you know more about these cars, when you know more about the racing. Well, you were rookie to it last week here, Alex Galonix. And I tell you what, two weeks in a row, they have put on a phenomenal race for you. Yeah, they put on such a great race that uh, the pronunciation of my name changed as well from Colonix to Colonix. It's incredible. Uh, we can change that again if you want in Alex Culp. Nice. Nice. We See, you know, us Australians, we, we shorten everything, buddy. It's, that's just how it works. We have nicknames for nicknames out here. Well, one of the nicknames that I don't think Forsyth wants to see is Mr. Loose as he got very loose there at a turn four and allowed Rick Ravon to go around his outside. Hadn't seen him mess up at all so far in this race, but I think as the pressure's going to him, he slipped up just a little bit, and now Ravon's got the position out front. 
Is it the pressure, Alex, or is it because it's starting to come down to crunch time? You're racing that little bit harder. Before, earlier in the night, you were taking a fair bit easier. You hadn't pushed the machinery to its limits and that little bit beyond, and all of a sudden you found those limits, and now it is that five-car battle pack because that mistake from Craig Forsyth checked out Wagner. Wagner had to back it up a little bit. All of a sudden, we have five cars. We're about to have seven cars. We're about to have the battle pack that we had for several laps when we went back green after that first caution. Wagner goes to the inside of Forsyth, gets tight. Charles Teed slides down the inside. He's going to get both of them. Charles Teed to P2. That is the move of the race for Charles Teed. He has not had a slice of luck to throw over the last five or so races that man has done. All of a sudden, he has come up trumps at one of the most fun races on the Dark Horse season. And now he's got Rick Raven in his sights to the inside. He's not happy with two cars on that last lap. He wants to make it the final car to overtake. And Raven all of a sudden thought, hey, I'm cruising. This race is going to be between me and Forsyth. He's going to change his mind on how he's going to win this thing. Let's not forget, Charles Teed was flipping end over end down the back straightaway earlier in this race. One faster pair later, he's in the battle for this win right now in one of the best positions with only six laps to go, five times this time by. And have a look at that battle pack. Everyone has tightened it up from first to seventh. This was a two-car chain. They didn't want to work together. It became a three-car chain. It became a five-car chain. And now there are seven cars. Any of them can win this motor race. But if you're going to get to the head of the pack at the right time, you've got to make moves now. You cannot leave it until the last two laps in these Indy cars, Alex. Well, somebody who is in the best position right now really is Charles Teed. They're just giving him the bottom as they're racing around the outside. And they were battling each other extremely hard here at the front. Charles T nowhere near as much. He's coming in here very late with fresh tires, cool tires at that, and is now going to possibly be looking for the lead down into turn three. Yeah, and here comes T. T sends us to the bottom of the racetrack once more. Does he get the slide job off? He does. Charles T has had a season to forget. Is he turning it around in Kentucky? The LMCgear.com dash at Kentucky is Charles Teed's opportunity to lead some laps. And he is in a three-car breakaway at the front end of this pack. Matt Wagner is starting to get sucked back. Ravon trying to show the nose to the outside. T is comfortable on the bottom. They're catching lap traffic at this point in time as well. Benjamin Combs is right here. There's going to be two laps to go at the stripe. And I tell you what, I think Wagner's out of this. I think he's just too far back. So now it's down to a three-car battle pack. It's Teed on the inside, Ravon in the middle, and Craig Forsyth was starting to show that nose. He'll go to the middle this time as Ravon splits it to the top. Forsyth, not quite there. They'll get the white flag this time by. Benjamin Combs is right there. He is going to offer draft support to this entire pack. And we start the final lap of the race. Teed had control, but Rick Ravon will take it at the line. One lap to go. Here we go, boys. If you thought this was getting exciting at the right time, it absolutely was. Charles Teed has had to slot a long way back. Forsyth has got the double draft. He's got to the inside. It's going to be three wide into the entry in the last quarter. Charles Teed has his nose ahead. Forsyth gets back to the gas early. Forsyth's got it. Here comes Nick to go through the middle. He's going to snipe a podium away from Charles Teed at the last. She goes down to the bottom of the track. Forsyth takes it. Forsyth takes it. Rick Ravon P2 and Charles Teed nearly took the win from everyone. Loses it all on the last lap. Doesn't even feature on the podium. But what a run from him towards the tail end of the race. Five laps of absolute mayhem and i tell you what that fuel stint it started off i thought we were going to get a boring finish dark horse never fails to deliver alex that truly was a phenomenal finish that i thought charles Teed had it he washed up a little bit out of turn four going on to the last lap that allowed both rick ravon and craig forsyth to go to the inside and i think that was the key move of the race right there that was the determiner of who ended up winning Oh my word, I, I have not seen a better race from these guys. That was all of the skills put on for display. Uh, I tell you what, Craig Forsyth might be celebrating in victory lane. I don't think he thought that he'd be celebrating in victory lane with about five laps to go. Yeah, and I was even concerned about his fuel earlier in the race. He pit so early compared to everybody else. Looked like he pit at just the right time. 32 laps in at the end of that race. He was right there on the edge of the fuel window to make it, but he made it nonetheless in victory lane. 
and Nick DeGroote. I said I thought Matt Wagner was way too far back at the start of that last lap to even be in with a chance. We were having a three-car pack. Well, he was out of contention for the win, Nick DeGroote, but championships are won and lost on picking up points wherever you can. Snipes away that third position from Charles Teed and Rick Ravon, the return to form. It's not a win for him. It's not the best possible return to the Dark Horse series, but it's the next best thing. P2, what a great race all around, Alex. And I mean, 13 cars out on track. You expect when you get 13 out cars out on track, it's not going to be the closest of races. The field's going to spread. Dark Horse, nah, forget that. 13 cars is enough for an absolute jam-packed finish in this series. 13 cars, and only one car was a lap down. 12 of the 13 finished on the lead lap in this race in 120 laps here at Kentucky. I mean, that's truly phenomenal stuff. I want to say a big shout out to the gymnastic skills of Charles Teed. He flipped, he somersaulted, and he tried to throw himself onto the podium. He did a very good job at getting very close, but unfortunately, this is motor racing, Charles Teed. You need to go practice those skills, not your gymnastics. I'm sure you've just hurt Charles Teed's feelings with that one. <laughs> I'm sure Charles Teed's grinning from ear to ear with the amount of luck he's had lately. So even a fourth place finish, he's happy with. All right, oh, well, hottest race time. Nick DeGroote makes another trip to the podium, and that will be a, another trip for Mr. Nick DeGroote to the broadcast booth. Let's go ahead and grab our finisher in the number 89 machine into the broadcast room. Mr. Nick DeGroot, my word, it's Scott and Alex up here in the FRN booth, and, uh, well, I feel like you're still recovering from what was the breakneck finish. Oh, yeah, that was insane. <laughs> I think that's all I can say. It was just insane. I mean, My I've word, when been... you... Sh Sorry. Go ahead, Alex. Sorry, my apologies. I've only <laughs> been in the booth here for two races, and you guys have put on two absolutely phenomenal races. I mean, is this just a regular thing for this league? You guys are abs <laughs> racing absolutely insane every single lap, and when I think the field's finally spread out, we get to the last 20, 30 laps, and you guys are right on top of each other again. I mean, w what are you guys doing to be able to stay that close the whole race? Well, I mean, the tire fall off here definitely helped make make an amazing race, but it's pretty cool that we could have such a small field, but it is such a competitive field. We're coming down to five laps to go there, and there's still seven guys in the battle for the win after, what, a 60-lap green flag run or whatever it was. I think it may have even been longer. That was just awesome racing all around, and I wish I had discovered what T did a little sooner, and that was you could run that bottom if you were just you kind of pedaled it and you were careful. Um, after nearly spinning before the green flag pit stops doing that, I, I just stopped using the bottom, but towards the end there, I saw T using it. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this will still work, and I figured that out with like two laps to go, so wish I had more laps, but man, still happy to get this thing on the podium. I thought we were going to finish like seventh there. Well, that's what we said. We you come out of the pits, and I mean, you had no one around you, absolutely no one to work with. And then all of a sudden, Guy Elbrooks just slots in right there and you guys start hammering away. And it's about hammering away at it throughout the race, isn't it? You cannot show up to one of these races and go, I know what the best line is. I know how to run it best. You have to come into the race and keep learning that whole race long. It, that is the benefit of Dark Horse. Yeah, absolutely. And I pitted earlier than all those guys in that front pack with the exception of Craig and Rick. So Guy L, he pitted the latest. So when he came out, I'm like, just get in front of me and I'm just going to latch on to you and you, you can lead us to the promised land. And that's exactly what he did. So I don't know if I was going to be able to catch them if I was all by myself the whole run because my tires were going to be dead by the end. I, I was not doing great if I was not behind people and having that downforce in my nose. So it just all worked out where we could go battle it out. And I mean, three wide for the lead last lap with uh, uh, those guys in front of me. That was just that was just insane. It's the culmination of multiple forms of strategy, multiple forms of good, hard racing, and it's a culmination of great respect between teammates. I'm going to give the opportunity to offer some thanks to all those people who support you, but I think you're going to want to lead off with a thanks to the league because that was phenomenal from the broadcast booth. I can't imagine how good that was for all the drivers out there in the cars. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you to this league for the incredible racing we get to do. Thank you for those drivers out there who who did put on an incredible show and race so close but so respectfully. You were asked to Craig, of course, getting another sweep. I think that's his second sweep this year with Area 51 and Dark Horse. Um, and yeah, thank you to Factor Back Motorsports, Motorsport.com, CoveyMore.com, Cowboy Shit, everybody else who um, supports us. And a special shout out to Ukraine. 
I know they're going through a lot right now and I uh, hope they can beat those guys back because they deserve to be free and they deserve to be a democracy. Thank you very much for the comments and everything tonight, Nick. Thank you very much for putting on a show. You get back out there. You hang out with those drivers and you have a great afternoon, a uh, great evening for us. Sorry, it's afternoon in Australia, evening for you guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Well, that is Nick DeGroot. And I'll tell you what, Alex, he, he, he said it. I, I think he, he mentioned everything that needed to be mentioned. It was good racing. It was hard racing. It was fair racing. And boy, wasn't it fun. All right. Time to have a chat to the man, the myth, the legend, Rick Ravon, the people's champion from last season, returns to the series, returns to the series in form, picking up the number one plate and putting it on the second step of the podium. Mr. Rick Ravon, it has been a absolute mammoth amount of time. I have missed you. The league has missed you. You're back. It's not a win, but it's just as good. Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's just as good. <laughs> Nothing's better than a win, but uh, yeah, thanks so much. I mean, you know, I, I miss racing with these guys. I just needed to kind of take a break after that last season. It was so intense, you know, the fight for the championship and everything else. Um, but, uh, you know, I sat back and watched as a fan watching these guys. They were just putting on a heck of a show every week. And I just, I, I enjoyed the broadcast, you guys in the booth, of course. And uh, I said, you know what? I think I'm ready to uh, jump back in and, and have some fun with them. So I just had such a great time tonight. I mean, win or lose, what a race. So much fun. You know, Rick Ravon, I, I'm a little bit curious about you tonight because you were one of the drivers I saw positioning his car. Definitely one of the most interesting. I saw a couple sliders there late in the race down in turns three and four i saw great positioning on restarts by your car what was the key to positioning here tonight in this race and how much did that help you keep your lead up front pretty much uh well first of all you know the tires started going away once the tires started going away you really it was real difficult to run that that bottom line in three and four no problem in one and two because it's uh you know it's it's not so tight but uh i mean it, it just pre it, it depended on where the other guys are running um, how old the tires were and, and what they were doing. I, I knew that I would be able to slice it down to the inside. If you got a good run on a backstretch, you would, you'd be able to clear them coming off a of four. Um, so I, I knew that. And I was, you know, trying to use that to my advantage because I knew, I knew that that would work. So I was trying to, you know, feed Forsyth 30 air. But then the next thing I know, here comes Matt Wagner. I'm like, oh, Wagner's up here. And then Teed was up there. Like, oh, Teed's up here too. Hey, this is, I mean, what a race. I don't even know what to say, man. It was just such a great race. It's it's been a while since you've been in the series, but the level of driving and the intensity of the driving is still there. But also the respect of the driving is, is still there. You cannot have a race yeah. of that quality without the level of respect and consideration shown for. I mean, you got involved in an incident early on with Matt Wagner. Matt Wagner, ah, oh, you know, I'm at fault. I've, I've checked up. I drive. But that's that's just good racing. Is when the drivers, everyone makes mistakes at different points of time. You let them make those mistakes and you move on. Yeah, well, you know, Matt, I guess he went down there and, and he pushed up a little bit. I know that, uh, you know, wasn't intentional. I felt bad for Matt. I saw him go spin. I said, oh, no, I hope he doesn't hit anything. And I think he came out of that okay. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, as, as far as the, the level of respect, I mean, that's what I loved about racing here in the last season. You know, it was it was so much fun. You, you know that you could race side by side with these guys. And, uh, you know, nobody really does anything stupid out there. They're very smooth and very calculated, and that's what makes it such a such a, a fun time and and such a real challenge because these guys are so darn good, man. Look, Rick, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back within the series, and an absolute pleasure to have you out on the track and display those skills again. I'm uh, gonna go open the the mic right now. This is your opportunity. You got anyone that uh, that you'd like to show some thanks to? Well, sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys, you know, FRN for broadcasting. Um, I'm sure you did a great job. I'm looking forward to watching it tomorrow in the truck. Um, obviously, a shout to uh, the, the guys that run uh, Dark Horse, you know, Charles Teed and um, uh, hey, Eric Peterson. Peterson, thank you. Sorry, it's been a while. I'm, I'm sort of drawing a blank. <laughs> Eric Peterson, and God bless him. He's, uh, you know, his dad's been uh, pretty ill lately. So, um, you know, his dad is in my prayers and, and, and uh, you know, his, his whole family. Um, shout out to those guys for putting on this show. Uh, shout out to everybody out there. Uh, race tonight. Craig Forsyth. Man, you know, Craig was one of those guys that said, hey, Rick, why don't you come back and race with us? You know, we'd love to have you. Uh, kind of got the juices flowing again. I says, yeah, you know, I'd love to do that. And then he goes out and kicks my rear end. So um, it was nice to get my rear end kicked by Craig because he's a fantastic racer. Uh, congratulations to him. Big shout out to him. 
And a special shout out to uh, Mr. Jay Z, who follows my sim racing career. I love you, Jay Z, and thank you for your support. Um, and last but not least, the Lord Jesus. Uh, I, I have to thank Jesus every single time. I love you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for the life you've given me. Thank you, guys. So great to be back. Well, thank you very much, Rick, for joining us up here in the broadcast booth. Next week, we'll see you, I hope, back out in Richmond. You're going to be uh, around next week? Yeah, I think I will be. I had so much fun. Uh, you know, my, my Wednesdays are, are kind of free. Uh, I should be home in time. You know, it was kind of crazy for a while on the truck. Uh, but I've been getting home fairly early. I think I'll be able to make these races. So I'm definitely going to try. You can count on that, Scott. All right. It'd be a pleasure to see you back out there again, rocking that number one plate. Have a great night, Rick. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. No problem. All right. Well, it's time to talk to race number two winner of the week. Uh, Craig Forsyth won the race last night out in the Area 51 in the IR18 machines, and he brings it down to victory lane once again. Craig Forsyth, two wins, two races this week. It's uh, You like this place around here, this Kentucky place. It's got an interesting track format, interesting layout, but it seems to work in your favor. Apparently, I like green walls. <laughs> I like green, so that works. We can we can put green on everything. This is true. Uh, I mean, stock car drivers, Alex, you're a stock car driver. Green's an unlucky car for you guys, not for the indie car guys. Yeah, we 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 don't talk about green here. It, it's not <laughs> good. It's not good. But Craig, talk to us about that race. I mean, that was an interesting last run to to the checkered flag after that pit stop. It actually looked like for the first time I think this season you lost time on pit road, which is uh, very unusual for you but that's the pressure of the situation it gets to us all in different ways at different times and then all of a sudden the pack closed in and with five laps to go i think the tail was set for a fairy tale finish i i that last five, five laps needs to be po posted up somewhere and and made for everyone to watch because that's 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 perfect dark horse right there that that was nail biting racing no i i had made a last minute decision to pit there and i was not set to come into the pits so yeah i knew as soon as i hit the line i had been slow de decelerating so i was rather disappointed when i when uh i i when i then came out and then rick uh rick was had almost a one second lead on me so that took uh many 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 perfect laps to uh finally get his draft so i could suck back up You know, I was curious, you had a great battle there with Rick Ravon for most of the race. I mean, what, what was the kind of respect you had between you two? Because in the middle part of the race, you two pulled out on the field by over a second for most of that middle run. But then at the end, you guys started battling. What's the kind of respect you have between you two? Oh, I logged in. I logged into the session and saw that he was in. He, he, he was joining the race. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, he is he is one fast competitor. So no, I I mean when w once we had that bit of a gap, it, I just I settled in behind him and knew that you know that was our that was our time to make hay and uh, and uh, try and see if we could you know get a extend our lead. I think at one point we were up to like one point five or something like that. Because as soon as he started fighting, you, you you started losing the 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 gap immediately. But I think it was about lap one hundred where I just said to heck with it. It's it's time to start battling and. Uh, play with the different lines to see which, you know, what line was going to be what I used for the last, you know, the last two laps or so. And then, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew the pack was going to catch up. I didn't realize it was going to catch up with all like eight or nine cars, but, uh, it, it went from, uh, it went from nail biting to just crazy with, uh, I mean, Charles dove in out of nowhere and held the bottom line better than anyone I've seen all night. And then, I mean, oh, uh, Lewis was, oh, it was crazy. There were cars everywhere and every, everyone was getting, getting their nose in front and could, couldn't have told you, I, I, I would have said I wasn't going to win on lap 118 because I, I think I was in third at that point and cars were fighting everywhere. And I think uh, going into one on the last lap, Rick just uh, didn't quite, didn't quite get low enough and I was able to stick my nose in and that was the difference. And then Charles co coming into three, if he'd been able to hold the bottom the same way he had a, a few laps before that would have been his, would have been his victory for sure. Look, I mean, just what a cracking race all, all around. I mean, Kentucky, it's probably one of the most unique layouts. We go from Pocono last week where it is again, one of the most unique layouts that we see 
uh, within oval racing and then Kentucky. It's, it's difficult to set it up. You cannot practice except for at Kentucky. How difficult is it to, to nail it every single lap, let alone on long stints? And the only practice you can get on long stints is in those races. You cannot practice that without the full pack of five cars or so. No, that was the big thing was figuring, figure, I mean, one one and two is, you know, that's easy, full throttle, hold the bottom, but then figuring out figuring out through three, four, how you're going to do your line based on the car ahead of you and, you know, the, the draft and the dirty air. And I don't think anyone held it as good as uh, Charles figured out towards the end there. But uh, I, 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 I knew I had, I was okay in the middle. I, I wasn't so good on the top line and I could do the bottom for you know on fresh tires of course but i wasn't willing anytime i tried to go down there on older tires i had to I, you know the back end started to kick out exactly how it happened to to wagner uh, earlier in the race where yeah the, the back end would just start kicking out on you and if you didn't if you didn't back pedal fast enough it would spin around well craig it's another week another race another victory for you and uh well time to thank the people that make this possible from your perspective is there anyone that you would like to to show your appreciation for uh, i gotta thank uh, jim over at uh, lmcgear.com and uh and 40 racewear um i mean all the boys at uh, dark horse and it was the best race of the season by far i mean everyone should watch that race it was uh it was a constant battle all through the pack it's, um Good bunch of competitors come race with us on Wednesdays. Uh, you guys over at FRN um, and Eric Peterson, uh, uh, his dad's uh, uh, have an issue, so that's why uh, he's not with. Eric's not with us right now. So uh, uh, you know, best of luck to to his family there, and uh, uh, that's it. All right. Well, thank you once again, Craig Forsyth. It's been an absolute pleasure having you up here in the booth. Absolute pleasure to have you part of the league. Absolute pleasure to race against you on Tuesday night. So. Uh... Enjoy the rest of your week, buddy, and we'll see you again on Tuesday. You bet you guys. Stay safe. Stay safe. Well, Alex, that brings us to the end of another edition of the Dark Horse Racing Series. This week, coming to you from Kentucky, provided one of the best races of the season, and I believe one of the best races ever. Next week, we head to Richmond. The difficulty level at Richmond takes it up quite a few notches. Yeah, Richmond is going to be an interesting race for sure. It's going to be one of two things. It's going to be a race where we're going to see a lot more spread out or we're going to see a lot of people clumped together because there's going to be some wrecks. Well, if you want to find out exactly how good the racing is after we go from a wide open track like Kentucky, you're going to need to tune in here next week. Unfortunately, though... I must bid adieu to the commentary box. Alex, it's been a pleasure working with you. We've only known each other about two weeks here in the commentary booth now, and I have to leave you. This is now your baby. I hand the reins over to you. I'm really disappointed, but, uh, I mean, Australian times, so there's not much you can do. So I want to say a big shout-out to you. Big thank you for, for the last two weeks. It's been an absolute pleasure broadcasting alongside of you. Big shout-out to Matthew Rodriguez, to Seth Cole, who I've had the pleasure with broadcasting with over the years. This isn't goodbye from me for Flat Out Racing Network. This is just goodbye for now, we're going to try and find some leagues that uh, that set up better with my time scale. So I want to say a big shout out to everyone who follows and supports the streams as well. Uh, I do it for you guys. I don't do it for, for money. I'm not interested in that. I do it because I love racing. So thank you to everyone that gets involved here. Yeah, it's going to be, we're going to miss you here, Sky. It was great talking to you the last couple of weeks. Don't like the nicknames though. Going to have to dump that one off the bridge, but you. Oh no, oh no, definitely... it's sticking. Oh, no, it's not. You've been it's really right. fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really fun to talk to, and I, I really enjoy it. And I'm glad you introduced me here to this league. This has been a blast, and I can't wait for next week. Well, Alex is going to go away and try and spend some time in some open wheel cars this week. Formula One season starting to kick off. Barcelona testing was over this week. I got spicy over that. And Scott McLaughlin and somebody from Australia uh, and New Zealand won the opening race of the IndyCar series. And Craig Forsyth went to Victory Lane in the Dark Horse and Area 51. If you like your racing action, you know where to keep that dial tuned. It's to the Flat Out Racing Network, broadcasting to you some of the best racing content that you can find uh, within iRacing. Turning left, doing it fast, doing it for extended periods of time. That's what we're all about. And we will see you again next week for another broadcast, courtesy of the Flat Out Racing Network. This broadcast is the copyrighted work of Flat Out Racing Network. It may not be rebroadcast, retranslated, or used in any form without the express written consent of Flat Out Racing Network and iRacing.com Motorsports Simulations. Flat Out Racing Network would like to thank you for your support and we hope you enjoy